42. Trev's Hockey Show. I'm the Trev. You know that. If you're tuning in, if you're watching, it's too sweet. Anyway, getting back on track with retired numbers. Uh, I know I've been putting this one off. Intentionally, I'm not entirely sure, but I've been putting this one off, and I keep telling myself, you know, the further behind I get, the longer it's going to take to make it. And because, P.S., I'm aware of the irony. The irony is not lost on me that I'm talking about the Canadians in a Bruins jersey. I don't have a Canadians jersey. That's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. I wanted to stick to connections. I got that, and I mean, this is pretty much making its debut on this channel. So, that's something. If this is too much of a trigger, I'm sorry. My bad. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> continuing back on with retired numbers today. We're doing a Canadians video, and there I'm gonna pre-warn you when it comes to retired numbers, the Canadians and the Maple Leafs are gonna have a lot. They're gonna take the longest, and I'm gonna try and make them as frequently as I can, but not go completely overboard on it. So, if that makes any kind of sense, let me know. Today we're talking about the number seven, hanging up in Montreal, that belongs to Howie Morenz. So Morenz made his debut with the Canadians on December 26th, 1923 against Ottawa. Now I have to pause right here. We have to rewind this a bit. It's not, not far, not far at all in a span of maybe a year. A year beforehand, Morenz was discovered in a Canadian National Railways hockey tournament for, for um, senior midgets which is basically the underage. Because uh, you've got to remember, at, at the time, 20 was still a minor. I think he had to be 21 at the time to be considered an adult. But anyway, Morenz was spotted by a guy who was a friend of Leo Dandaran, who was the owner of the Canadians at the time. And he was talked about how he told Dandaran how good he was. They scored this many goals in the game, and yada, yada, yada. And Dandaran decided he wanted him to sign with the Canadians. But because, again, Morenz was still a minor, he had to talk to Howie's dad. And his dad said he wanted to finish his apprenticeship on the railroad, which would have took another two years. So that was okay, that's fine. But it was later discovered, and this is the sneaky and what if of this video. It was discovered that Howie's dad was in contact with the Toronto St. Patrick's, who we now know as the Toronto Maple Leafs. So, in the, the fear that Morenz would have signed in Toronto, Dan Duran sent Cecil Hart, a close friend of his, and we will do a video on Cecil Hart at some point, at least his contribution to the game, to Stafford, Ontario, and told him sign Morenz no matter the cost. So on July 7th, 1923, Morenz signed a three-year contract with the Canadians were $3,500 per year with a $1,000 signing bonus. Now, $3,500 now is just shot, just north of $52,000 a year. So, take that how you will. Which, by the time, it was considered quite, uh, quite considerable for a first-year professional. So, it was no big deal because they thought he could produce, right? However, and there has to be a however to this story. Right after signing with them, Morenz kind of decided to reconsider his decision. And that and the people he knew in his community didn't want him to go play Montreal. They wanted to stay here and play in Toronto. Stay here. I don't live in Toronto. <laughs> Which led Howie to write a letter to Leo Dadaran saying, hey... You know, I, I think I made a bad decision. Here's that signing bonus check. I haven't cashed it yet. And after receiving the letter, Dan Durant phoned Morans, told him, come meet me in person. We'll talk about this. And as Morans began to explain himself, he started to break down. And it was at that point, Dan Durant began t telling him in response, hey, if you don't come back, if you don't join the Canadians, your hockey career will be over before it even begins. So hearing that, Morenz obviously relented and agreed to report to training camp later in the year. And now we can go back to December 20, 
6, 1923. In his debut game against the Ottawa Senators, where he only scored a goal. But in his rookie season, he managed to play 24 games, scored 13 goals with 3 assists for 16 points, which was still good enough for 8th overall in league scoring. We're going to begin a trend here, and I'll I hope you guys can follow along. At the end of the season, of course, the Canadians played for the Stanley Cup, and it was still, I believe it was still NHL versus the rest of the hockey leagues. Morenz went to score a hat-trick against the team, the Calgary Tigers, from the West Coast Hockey League in Game 1 of a best of, I think it was a best of three total goal series. He scored a hat-trick in Game 1, which Cal Montreal won 6-1. to one. In Game 2... He managed to score a goal, but it was still a 3-0 final for Montreal. So obviously they won the Cup, and it was the first Stanley Cup in Howie Morenz's tenure with the Canadians. Not a bad start. In 1924-25, he played 30 games, managed to score 28 goals with 11 assists for 39 points. So right off the, right off the hop, he's already doubled his previous season's point totals, so... Not bad for a second-year player, and it was good enough to go fourth in league scoring. Playoffs came around, and the Canadians contended a cup for the cup again. However, they lost to Victoria of the Western Hockey League. In the 1925-26 season, Moran's tied teammate and linemate, Ariel Joliet, in leading the Canadians in scoring with... How much did he score in that year? 26 points which was comprised of 23 goals, which led the league in goals, and three assists. So not a bad jump at all. That was good enough for fifth overall in league scoring. The next season, he managed to score at the time a career best, 25 goals, seven assists, and 32 points. So, I mean, his production's kind of fluctuating in the, in the coming years here. But it was still good enough again to lead the league in. It wasn't until 1927-28 that he became ultimately one of the best at the time. I mean, you would say it was a career year for him in 27-28. In 43 games, scored 33 goals, 18 assists for 51 points. And he was the first player in the NHL to score 50 points. So not a bad year at all. On top of that, he would be in the top scorer in the league, led the, league in, the team in points again. He also won the Hart Trophy as league MVP. It's not a bad gig at all. 28-29, kind of saw a bit of a drop. I mean, he still played enough games. He still played 42 games. Scored 17 goals and 10 assists for 27 points. So to go from 51 to 27, yeah, understandable, but good enough for 7th or at least a tie for 7th, and still good enough to lead the team. So, still doing pretty good as far as productivity and points is concerned. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. 1929-30 was a good year, again, for Morenz, becoming the first player in NHL history to score 40 goals. So, take that to Trivial Pursuit next time. 40 goals, 10 assists for 50 points. So he was one point short, short of matching his career best. But it was also a good year in the sense that in six playoff games with three goals, the Canadians won the Stanley Cup. So second cup for him. And he was tied, or he wasn't, uh, he wasn't tied for anybody. He was set, he was, he led the team in goals, regular season wise. In those 40 goals that he scored during the 1930 season, Five of them were against the New York Americans. So he really liked to score. 1930-31 was another good year for Morenz. Managing to play 39 games, he scored 28 goals, 23 assists for 51 points. Matched the career best. So that's pretty awesome. And actually managed to make it to the playoffs again, where in 10 games he scored one goal. And that was because of a shoulder injury he suffered against the finalists, the Chicago Blackhawks. Managed four assists for five points, but still got a set, got a third Stanley Cup. So not a bad gig, not a bad gig. So who knows what would happen if he did sign with Toronto, right? 
should also mention that in 1930, or 31, sorry, on top of being the league scorer, he was also awarded the Hart Trophy as league MVP for the second time, as well as a point to the newly created All-Star team for the, for the season. So he's a first-team All-Star for the first time. Pretty awesome. For the 31-32 season, this will be the last time we see Marin's leading the leading the team in goals or assists or points. As he only finished third in league scoring. I know, right? Only. <laughs> but still managed to go 24 goals, 25 assists, and 49 points. So still pretty damn good, even for the fact that his production is noticeably declining. But during the 1932 season, in a game against the New York Americans on March 17th, he managed to pass Cy Danini as the all-time career points leader with his 334th point. So think of how it was when Gretzky passed how Morenz had his moment passing Danini. So, early history. But also during the 1932 season, he still had enough time to claim his third Hart Trophy. So the first player in league history to win three Hart Trophies was also named first team all-star at the center position for the second year in a row. So not bad, not bad, even though injuries and age is starting to catch up with Morenz. For the 1932-33 season, this will be the last time we see Morenz in the top 10 in league scoring. As the productivity really started to hit a decline, he played 46 games, managed to score 14, point, 14 goals, 21 assists for 35 points. So really starting to go down, but at the same time, again, age, fatigue, and injuries were catching up to the man. In 33-34, he only managed to play 39 games, but that was because of a really bad ankle injury, where he scored 8 goals, 13 assists for 21 points. Didn't even crack the top 10. So with his decline, ultimately, you had the trade rumors come in, and he'd be the first to say, you know what, if I have to be traded, if I can't play in Montreal, if I can't lace a skate here, I'll never play anywhere else. But needless to say, that didn't necessarily happen or come to fruition as he was traded on October 3rd, 1934, to the Chicago Blackhawks. But like all good stories, we have a comeback. It was in the summer of 1936 that the Montreal Canadiens decided, decided to rehire Cecil Hart as for being their coach on their team, and he agreed only on the condition that they got Morenz back. And they did. On September 1st, 1936, the Canadians bought out the contract, or at least bought the contract, from the New York Rangers. He had been dealt mid-season in 35-36 from Chicago to New York. And by mid-January, his point totals were getting really, really good. He was doing better than he had the last couple seasons, managing to rack up four goals, 16 assists, and 20 points in his final season. But like most good stories, most comeback stories, there's always a heartbreaking end. Now, on January 28, 1937, a game against Chicago, Morenz went after a puck in the Chicago end while being chased by Earl Seibert, and Morenz lost his balance and fell to the ice, crashing into the boards and catching his left skate in the wooden siding. With Cybert unable to stop, he landed on him with full force, and the resulting injury snapped Morenz's left leg. It was a little while later that things did not get necessarily better or good for him. And on March, when is it? March 8th, at the age of 34, he died from complications to blood clots that came with his broken leg. That evening, the Canadians were supposed to play the Maroons, and they did. They held a two-minute silence and wore black armbands for the entire game, likewise with games against the Rangers and the New York Americans. And on March 11th, Morenz received a state funeral inside the Montreal Forum to some 50,000 people who had come and paid their respects to the man. He definitely left an impact as far as being a Canadian's favorite, being a fan favorite, and a community favorite. So, it's no surprise 
that on November 2nd, 1937, five days before the Howie Moran's benefit game, much like they did with Ace Bailey, his number seven was retired to the rafters for the Montreal Canadiens being the first player in franchise history, but definitely not the last. Definitely not the last, but we'll get into those when we get into those. All told, in his time with the Canadians, in 460 games, he scored 257 goals for 187 assists and 944 or 444 career points with 508 penalty minutes. Where did I get the 900 from? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Having won the Stanley Cup three times, being the top scorer in the league twice, winning three Hart Memorial trophies, two first All-Star team nominations, a second All-Star team nomination in 1933, being an honorary inductee into the Hockey Hall of Fame in its first year of induction in 1945, as well as being named one of the NHL's greatest players to coincide with the NHL centennial. At the time, or in 1950, Canadian press named him the best hockey player in the first half of the 20th century. And, yeah, we could go on. There's lots of things they've said about Morenz that have been... Nothing but good about the man who could have been, quite arguably, the league's first genuine superstar. So that's episode 42, which has Hockey Show. Yeah, I know this one felt a little bit longer to do, but you can only imagine what some of the ones I'm coming into are going to be like. <laughs> Let me just think of this video. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it. If you want to, that little red button over there. We're almost there. Let's hit 50. Let's really do it. I want to thank you for tuning in, though. Your viewership always means so much to me. Always has. Always will. Don't forget it. I do appreciate it. It means the world to me that you guys are tuning in, watching my stuff. I do appreciate it very, very much. Uh, if you want to, you can find Trev's Hockey Show on Facebook at Trev's Trade Page. You can find the parent channel on Facebook at Trev's TV. You can find me on Instagram at Rockstar Trev TV. Moving forward, as far as Jersey retired numbers is concerned... We got one that isn't necessarily recognized anymore in Detroit. So we're getting into teams I actually have jerseys for, which is awesome. <laughs> um, as far as everything else, we got a jersey reveal to do tomorrow. Um, and I do want to get a start on a few different projects. I know I mentioned that I want to do defunct teams. Well, I still want to do those, but I also want to do a few other things. Um, so either way, in the meantime, and in between time, be on the lookout for more videos from the Trev. Later.